Hey, everybody, welcome back. I'm Emily Moyer, and I am always delighted when I get an email or a Facebook message from my good buddy, the handsome, the dashing, the brilliant Darren Williams. And this time, he said he wanted to talk tennis, so my day couldn't be any better. Darren, how you doing over there? Thank you for having me, Emily, um, and everybody else. Just a bit of housekeeping. I used to be on a Daz Alt Theory. And I have got a very fun story um, at the end of the year review around how I upset a star of Netflix that resulted in me no longer having that uh, Twitter account. Darren, your sound, Darren, your sound is a little bit funny. Try coming a little closer, see if that makes it better. Okay, sorry about this. Uh, yeah, people. So as we said that better, yeah. So basically, what it is is that um, I had an old Twitter account that was published and well known, and in the conversation regarding our wanted friend from Wuhan with a major star of Netflix, uh, that incurred the wrath of Netflix, and not Netflix. Sorry, all right. Let me let me rewind it. Very stressful in the United Kingdom. We are ruled by a person who is a caricature playing the role of a prime minister. So everybody's daily life here in the United Kingdom is, is somewhat intense. Yes. Because we do not know what this supposed leader is going to do next. Sort of also mirrors what happened in Argentina with Evita Perón where they had the leader of Argentina, but the real leader was his wife. And this is actually being mirrored, ironically, in the United Kingdom of all places, a nation that has historic rivalry and tension with Argentina. So some people are claiming that the Prime Minister's wife has the actual control of the country, and he does everything she says just to make her happy. So our entire nation is being run under the dynamics of a marriage so it doesn't get as medieval as you can in a neo 21st century existence that happens to be one of the most medieval there is ironically so maybe this is the universe playing a cosmic joke on the popular britain but if people it is true terrifying so Going back to my Twitter thing, as I was trying to tell you all, I had an established Twitter account. I then sent a tweet to a star of a show on Netflix around our unwanted friend. And they didn't like it. Then weird things were happening to my Twitter account. I got the message, deleted that account, and then the next day created another one that is similar to the name of what I previously had. So for all of you that may follow Emily and may enjoy our conversations, if you try to tweet me on the old account, that doesn't exist. But the new account's a lot more catchier. It's called alt underscore Daz. Ah. So it doesn't get as much um, easy as that, people. So as I say, this is where we are a little bit at the moment in the UK. Uh, you, you, took out the, you, you took out the part where people mistake you for a fairy. That's no fun. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, so we've got that. Then, in an ironic point of view, who knows which nation is worse? Because your nation at the moment is run by a man that seems more deluded than what we've got at the moment. Yeah. So it's a, it, it seems that Britain and America, the Anglo-American world, is on a race to the bottom. And who's going to get to the bottom first, Britannia or Uncle Sam land? So uh, uh, there, um, Mike Williams, you know, from Sage of Quay had a funny post on YouTube, you know, community posts yesterday that showed like those signs you see over the freeway when there's an Amber Alert, it says Amber Alert, uh, 78 year old male wandering around Washington DC thinking he's president. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good one. It was cute. But yes, we are in fabulously strange times right now. I mean, like the, the part that's crazy about it is for how crazy it seems. 
Like it's quiet at my home. I look outside, the birds are chirping, the tree is green, the weather is nice, people, you know, whatever. So it's, it's really something to behold both things simultaneously, right? When we thought about the chaos of, you know, war, the way we think about war in the past, you just think about everything being, you know, shooting, dirt, everything a mess, nothing, you know, bread lines, da, 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 da. you don't think about like, it's a beautiful day. And also this is going on, right? Like, it's just, it's the strangest juxtaposition that we are living through um, right now. And I think it, it, it requires quite a bit of like mental um, dexterity to be able to like handle it. Yeah, it's very intense because ultimately these people in the positions they've been allowed to be in have a vast amount of control over our daily life. Yeah. And if, if they can exhibit such bizarre, contradictory, perplexing behaviour. And then the other scary thing is they do it to each other. Right. So an example of this is a NWO poster boy, Justin Trudeau, who is the political leader of Canada. He tried to contact President Biden to find out exactly what the hell was going on in Afghanistan last week. And Biden refused to deal with his phone call. He then contacts the vice president. Is it Kamala? Is it Kamala? She can't decide how to pronounce her first name. So he then contacts her. She then refuses to answer. And that leads in desperation for Trudeau to then make calls with Hillary Clinton to try to use her as a conduit to reach the president. <laughs> and they share a land border with each other. Canada and America share a land border. So you'd think the lines of communication would be very close. So if Biden can treat an ally in Justin Trudeau in that way, then where is he at, at the moment? So it's all very surreal. It's all very perplexing and worrying. Nobody seems to know who and what is in control. So because of all of this, it then led me about tennis and about your passion for the game yes. and your enthusiasm for it. And one of the things you are, either if you know it or if you don't, you seem to know things before they arrive. So I was like, she always talks about tennis. She tries to put tennis into conversation with guests. And sometimes the guests are politely not interested because tennis just isn't their thing. Right. But because you are so passionate about the game, it comes out. So then I was thinking, okay, tennis. And then for some reason I was on a, on a, on a website and they had an advert for the US Open. And right next to it was for Chase, Chase Manhattan. Yeah. So I was like, okay, then that's corporate interest. Let's see what's going on with the corporate side of it. Why would they link a bank with a tennis tournament? So predominantly where the logo of the partner, the corporate partner is equal to that of the tournament, where normally in other sports, the logo of the corporate partner is a lot more smaller. But well, then I looked at it and was like, okay, there's a lot of heavy corporate bank investments in tennis. But then I started going back, looking at the other Grand Slams, and there is a lot of corporate merchant bank. Totally. And I'm like, okay, why have they selected this sport and maybe not one such in soccer that has more eyes on it? So then another thing got my radar sort of synchronistic in terms of Piers Morgan, who appreciates tennis. And he, he then had a rant on Twitter around changes to the facilities of the US Open, in which quiet rooms will now be implemented to 
on players' mental health. Mm-hmm. And this then links back to the French Open of this year with the new poster of tennis, Naomi Osaka, I believe her name is, or, or Osaka. Mm-hmm. And I have always been fascinated with it because it, as somebody who is of mixed heritage, I have heard a number of different things about her, and not like urban myths. So a example of it is one person told me that her parents are adopted Japanese and they did NGO work in Haiti, saw it in an orphanage, then adopted it and took her back to Japan. Other people told me that she's the product of a Haitian couple who then, in an in a immigration refugee manner, were given asylum in Japan. They then met an elderly Japanese couple who then adopted her, and that mirrored uh, the life of a soccer player called Mario Balotelli, mm-hmm. whose parents are from Ghana. They then relocate as refugees to Italy. They have problems, internal dynamic problems within the family, but they befriend uh, a white Italian family who are fond of Mario, and then they then adopt Mario fully from his parents and give him the Italian surname Balotelli. So other people were saying that Naomi Osaka's parents did, did a Madonna, someone that, again, is very close to you, and then they flew out to um, Haiti, selected her, and then just took her back to Japan. So I am hearing about four or five different narratives about this one person. And then when the media is talking about her, they're not really raising the fact of who she is. Now, ultimately, she does not look Japanese. So we have to talk about the elephant in the room. What is a heritage? Let's deal with that and let's move on with the tennis game, who she is. But because of reasons of political correctness and the mainstream media, which is generally white people, because of cancel culture, not wanting to be as racist and not wanting the finger of social media being pointed at them, you never clearly talk about her background. So it led to these different things. And somebody told me her parents went to Haiti to adopt her, moved back to Japan. They were victims of extreme racism. And then they moved to New York. And then she learned to play the game uh, in a community, a children's tennis program in Plushy Meadow. So I'm like, so there's a New York dynamic and an American dynamic on top of a Haitian dynamic, on top of a Japanese dynamic. Well, All and right. Then, and then on top of her, some of her formative years in tennis, then being in Southern California. And then I think ultimately she lives in Florida now, right? Which so she's kind of been to all the sort of tennis hot spots in the United States. Um, there's a lot going on there. Um, so let's do this. Um, do you, uh, okay, so first of all, this will be a two-part special. So there'll be a public portion and a patron's portion today, and then another one next week. So we are recording this on, on Thursday, September 2nd. Um, it will probably come out on Monday, and then we'll record the other thing probably the following Monday after the U.S. Open wraps, where we can kind of see where some of this stuff went, and we'll do a show, uh, you know, we'll, it'll be out a little bit after that. So this will be a two-part kind of series on this. Um, Darren, you sent me your notes, and whenever I get your notes, I'm always fascinated, right? Because part of the reason I love talking to you is just you look at the same situation that I look at, and you see the, you know, it's kind of like when a tall person and a short person look at the same thing, right? They kind of see something different based on the angle that they're looking at or what part attracts them or whatever. So I was like, okay, like this is actually really interesting and kind of brilliant because you went somewhere. You're looking at some of the same things that I've been looking at and thinking about. There's some others as well that we can get into. 
Um, but it was like, okay, like this is just like a completely different uh, angle that I would have gone up, gone with this, but, but, but I like it, right? So I'm gonna ask you here, do you want to, um, I have your notes in front of me here. Um, do you want to start, do you wanna kind of use the notes as the, as the outline? And, and cool. start, or, or do you want to get more into, because you started your notes with sort of uh, this idea that you find the tennis and the people less interesting now than you did at a previous period, right? Um, and I, I have a lot to say about that. And then everything else was really more about current sort of social and political dynamics around tennis. So would you rather, would you like to do the retrospective first? And then in the second part, move on to the sort of social political stuff, or do you want to start with the social political and then move on to the retrospective? I'll do choice number one, Miss Moya. Choice because, number one. Because my brain is dyslexic, and that's another reason why we have these interesting conversations. Yeah. Because I see things at random angles at random times. Yeah. So what it is is that the game of tennis got my interest in the year 1985. And the reason for that was due to one person, Boris Becker. Mm -hmm. Now, Becker was an unseeded 17-year-old that managed to win the men's single title at Wimbledon. And for those of you that can't remember 1985, because it was that long ago, or some of you weren't even born then, this was a land before the internet. And what me and Emily are doing now would require a rather expensive landline call. So the world had less entertainment and Wimbledon every year as it is, it's always on the BBC, free to watch national television. But it had a lot more importance because entertainment was less. So it was a big moment in people's lives. I've spoken to family members older than me and they said that they had friends that deliberately booked two weeks off to watch the entire tournament. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the tournaments is played Monday to Friday on a 8.30 a.m. to sometimes 7 p.m. basis. So that's when the majority of people that were hooking to come home. Darren, Darren oh. your, your sound is wavering a little bit. Sorry. I'm wondering if the sound would be better if you removed your headset. Can I can I hear what that sounds like if you remove your headset? I'm, I've got headphones. Uh, let me wear on the sound. Uh, oh, that's why. Sorry. Um, I've got the microphone. Is that oh, better? That's way better. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. So what we can do, we can start it from now. No, we're good. It's okay. Okay. This is terrible before, but this is better. Perfect. Keep all going. right. All no, right. So no, nobody listens to me for the sound quality. <laughs> okay, all right then. So <laughs> if you want to, I'll just do that as a means of editing, and we can start from now. No, no, no we're good. Keep going. All right. We're on a tight time ship here. So. Okay. All right. So, so basically, the game of tennis it interested me in 1985. I would have been eight years old. And the reason for that is Boris Becker is an unseeded teenager at 17 years old and he wins the men's single title. And because we didn't have the internet and we don't didn't have console games and we didn't have all of these different things that get our attention, media and entertainment was very, very limited. So in some ways it meant more to, to the population. So some people would often take two weeks annual leave from their employer yeah. and they would basically watch the whole tournament. So the whole nation was just in utter shock that a 17 year old would win Wimbledon and nobody had ever heard of him. Now, Boris Becker did win the junior tournament the previous year, but nobody really knew him because the junior tournament didn't really get that much attention. They would briefly talk about the winner of it on the Sunday of the men's single final, 
but basically it it was something that was a periphery. So Becker got the public imagination and because I'm so young, I'm eight years old. He's 17, he's sort of in my age range in a way. So he gets the public imagination. He plays tennis like nobody's ever seen. He uses his athleticism. There's a famous photo of him doing a ridiculous swan dive to save a point. And that was just the image of, of the whole tournament because nobody had seen such athleticism in a tennis player previous to that. Sure, McEnroe had some, Bjorn Borg had some, um, but not that level of just constant up and down yeah. and running and having that energy and that enthusiasm that a 17 year old has. So from that moment, it seemed to open my awareness of tennis and it got more popular within the United Kingdom. And one after another, year after year, for about a 16 year period, up until 2001. Um, ironically, when the world changed, so the US Open is, I think, before September the 11th, the men's final. So the world basically ended that we knew it on the on the end of the US Open 2001 with Leighton Hewitt winning it. And that was an important win. And then a few days later in the same city, 9-11 happens. So, yeah. it se- so it seems there's two things that are representative about tennis and reality and marking in game. And then if we look at that 1985 to 2001 period. Robert Phoenix would be a better person to elaborate on this, but it's a magical time for sport. Mm. There are amazing characters in the NBA. Uh, The Celtics and the Lakers are having this yearly rivalry that's very intense, that's very even, led by two great players in Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, who have a shared history going back to the college game. And then there's a golden era within baseball. There is a golden era in my country in soccer where there's all of these great teams and managers and players. And the thing that connects them all is that there's a personality aspect. They were allowed to be individuals. So recently there's been an acclaimed documentary series called The Last Dance which is about that era of NBA basketball that looks at sort of the end of the Celtic-Lakers rivalry and the beginning of Michael Jordan and all the people he who he was rivals with. But the last stance shows that people were allowed to be personalities. Yeah. Okay, Stop there because otherwise I, I, I can't bite off anymore before I forget what you said. So sure, I do yeah. on it, right? Okay. So you started with Boris Becker, which is a really uh, interesting place to start. So obviously, like I became familiar with tennis at about the same period that you did. My mom always played tennis. So like we didn't watch a ton of it in the house, but it would be on once in a while. She likes to watch when Chris Everton and, and Martina would play, or, you know, I re- would remember seeing. Mac and Rowan Connors as a kid and whatnot. And yeah, we would usually have tennis on the final weekend of Wimbledon or the final weekend of the US Open or something, but it wasn't like this obsessive watching of it like I do now. Um, but I remember the, you know, so the first person I was really moved by that like captured my attention was in the same time period as you. And it was kind of a similar story, but not quite. And that was a person who you left from your list, who was also fabulous during those years. And that was Jennifer Capriati, right? Also incredibly young when she broke through, 14 years old, I think, in 1986, if I'm correct. It was many, many, many years before she ever, she didn't win a major until she was in her late 20s, many years later after a comeback. But she also came with sort of like an energy and a style that was uncommon, very different than Boris Becker, but also I was, my mind was captured by that. I vaguely remember Boris Becker from that time, but I think it's interesting that you were moved by him because of 
where he finds himself now. So he actually is one of the only people from the tennis world that has crossed over in some way into the alternative media world. And that was, he was interviewed last year or the year before by Brian Rose, who like, you know, made a big, I don't care for him, but he made that big splash sort of at the beginning of COVID with all of his controversial interviews. He had interviewed Boris Becker. And I'm sure that the reason he interviewed Boris Becker was based on the fact that for a couple of years, he had a coaching relationship with Novak Djokovic, right? And um, so he is a, a controversial figure, both in the tennis world, but also in some somewhat informational realms. He's, he says things that are very controversial, similar to Novak Djokovic. You and I wouldn't find them controversial, but the average person finds them controversial because they go against the established orthodoxy, both of the tennis and societal establishment in a different, you know, in a way that the other players don't really do it. Um, what's interesting, is Laura brought up some, that picture uh, that you were talking about with Boris Becker swan diving, which I've seen over the years in pictures of tennis. But there's actually a picture of Stefano Tsitsipas, who's another person who's having a lot of controversies right now over his behavior. And there's actually a picture of Stefano Tsitsipas making almost the same leap for the ball, you know, this year on the clay that that Boris Becker made all those years ago um, on the grass at that, that famous photo. But the only other time I think we've seen a young teenager that we've seen two other times when a young teenager has been able to take the horns and ride it all the way, right? Someone you've never heard of, they show up and they win. And that's uh, Rafael Nadal, 2005 French Open, right? When he was, I think, still 18 years old and began his dominance. And then Maria Sharapova in, at Wimbledon. And I think her first win was like maybe 2004 or something like that. She was sat 15 or 16 years old and she literally blew Serena Williams off the court. So I can't think of other times that a teenager has shown up, created that much excitement, and then rode the horse all the way in, right? Like Michael yeah. Michael Chang had a, a sort of a bit of a wave, but he never had that longevity like a Becker or a Sharapova. Or, or the fiery type of personality. He was a much more uh, conservative personality yeah. guy. Um but anyway, so I think that starting with Boris Becker the way that you did was really interesting. And then, you know, you're right about that period of time in sports. There were really unique characters. During those years, I, it, was a, it was a very interesting time in gymnastics too. Like the only sports that have really captured my attention other than like, you know, you'll watch, I'll watch track and field or skating during the Olympics. But the only sports that I really pay attention to on a regular basis are gymnastics, tennis, and baseball. And they're all sort of, tennis and gymnastics are really individual sports. Baseball, even though it's a team sport, only one person is up at a time. So your attention is on one person basically at a time. And there's all three sports have space in between plays to have conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Like one athlete goes in gymnastics, then you can talk about their routine. The point is played in tennis. You can chat for a few minutes that, you know, the, hit, the batter's been up and then you can chat. So I kind of like that style of sport. But there were, gymnastics was interesting during that period too, because it was the time that you moved from the, um, the communist bloc nations dominating gymnastics into the United States beginning to create a dynasty. It was during that period of time. So you had all these individuals from these various countries all vying in a way that hadn't happened before or, you know, or since in the same way and large personalities. So I think that that Robert's assessment of that period of time. Is, well, he hasn't. It was just my suggestion. Your suggestion. That, that maybe if you and Robert could talk about what was going on in terms of astrology between 1985 and 2001, because there was some thing within the ether that seemed to uh, produce these individuals. Like I look, for instance, at the game of soccer and it's sort of, in my city, 1985 is sort of the rise of the rivals of Liverpool, Everton. And then the next year, 1986, it's Liverpool and Everton vying for the championship, but also vying to do the double, which is to win a cup as well as the league. And Liverpool just pipped Everton 
to win the double in 1986. So it seems that from 1985 to 2001, something was changing. And then they have the um, hashtag, I'm sure you've seen, it's coming home. Which is all which perplexes Americans on social media because they're always like, what is coming home? But that relates to some a tournament that happened in 1996 here in the United well, in England with the Euros. So between 85 and 2001, so there was I all can, the I can tell you what, what that is. So 1985 was right there about the time. What, what's the year, uh, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall? 1989. That's 1989. What's the year? And what's the year that the uh, the Berlin Wall was also? 19, what year was that? That was the same year. Yeah, 89. Yeah. Nine. Okay, so we were in those years of sort of leading up to that, right? Like you know, we'd had a 1984 Olympics with no uh, Soviet participation, right? There, a bunch of the 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 communist bloc nations did not come, and then you know the next Olympics, 88. Korea, and then we have all this stuff start to come down. So I think there was like a push towards a certain kind of perceived freedom that was beginning to happen that created colorful personalities. People were starting to feel a little bit more flexible about speaking out. And that was part of the buildup to those things coming down. And then obviously like, I like this line that you drew about 2001, right? It is interesting that, yes, the, the men's final generally, the, the finals generally happen that same weekend, that whatever, September 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, it's generally around that time. And yeah, I think that did happen, that there was the, uh, the final and then Monday morning was, uh, you know, what happened in New York. But there was also like several years back, I remember when Kim Kleisters won the US Open, and we're going to talk about Kim Kleisters in a second as well. But um, when when she won the U.S. Open in like the early 2000s, whatever it was the same year that the thing happened in New Orleans, right? And she uh, donated a bunch her whole prize money to the situation in New Orleans. So both we we had the same thing happen a hurricane in New Orleans this past week, right before the U.S. Open started. And then I don't know if you saw what was going on at the U.S. Open last night and is continuing to go on. But that same hurricane Ida is literally like not only is it forcing play to stop on the outer courts, but even one of the co covered courts, the water is coming in and flooding the court, right? And so it's, it, it, it's, it, it does seem to always be wrapped up in this chaos where there's questions about where this chaos is actually emanating from, right? Like the nature of these events and the US Open seems to be somehow wrapped in that all the time. So it's a very, it's much more it feel, has a much more political feel to it than any of the other, you know, political or sort of social energetic feel to it than any of the other slams do. But that period of time that you, I just want to kind of look at your list. So, right, uh, you have this list. I'm just going to show people in case I opt not to say all of the names, but these were the people that you had listed as really fascinating players in your mind um, during this period of time that you felt was, was really interesting. And I'd say that you left a couple of names off of this list. And those names are Jennifer Capriotti and Kim Kleisters, right? Um, as to me, the thing that really be where my obsession with tennis came was in the late 90s and into the early 2000s, watching Jennifer Capriotti, Kim Kleisters, and Serena Williams, they would, when, when two of the three of them would get into, and there was another one named Justine Hennen, who I don't care for personally, but she was part of that drama. I just didn't love her. Um, but when I could get like D Serena and Kim Kleisters or Kim Kleisters and Jennifer Capriotti, those would be the matches that really got me super into it, where like every game went to deuce five, six, seven times, 10 times, some games lasting 15, 20 minutes, I mean, just neither one of them willing to give in, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's what really started my obsession. And um, she actually, Jennifer Capriati, actually the, the majors that she, she won two majors in 2001, even though she had begun on a professional tour in like 1986, I think when she was 14. 1990. 1990? Okay, sorry, 1990. So she didn't actually, you know, she kind of went up and down. She had drug overdoses and runaways and all this kind of stuff. But she won the, the Australian and the French, I believe, in 2001. And some of her 
she had crazy matches with Serena and Kim at the US Open, even though she never won them. Like just really interesting stuff. But of this list that you have here, I, I don't have a very big memory of Arancha Sanchez Vicario other than that is the coolest name I've ever heard. <laughs> right, it's a great name. Gordon. Like basically a, a female Nadal that um, was a very short, like stumpy woman that was up against like the elegance of Graf. So right. Steffi Graf makes everything look easy. Right. There's like, there's like, just like, there's no effort there. There is effort, but she makes it look really easy. And then you've got sort of the Martina Navratilova who is refusing to grow old. And it seems that the older she's getting, the more intense she is about the game. Yeah. So there's that. And then there's obviously Gabrielle Sabatini, who's this like goddess come from Mount Olympus to be with us mortals. <laughs> so, right. so, so you've got Arancha Sanchez Vicario and her style of play, I would say, is definitely a basis on Rafa Nadal. Yeah. Like that every point matters. Yeah, it, well, every point is match point for Nadal. Every yeah, exactly. Point. So, the, but your list is interesting for a lot of reasons. You have like Goran Ivanisevic, who also has had periods of time coaching some of the very top players right now. It, it, you know, like he sat in the box with uh, Milos Raonic, Novak Djokovic, a couple of other people. I think he's coached Novak Djokovic. He's He was one of the... Uh, early people to really like now they call them sort of serve bots right like the big serve completely dominating the game what you said about Sabatini is right Michael Chang I just remember him from that one French Open win where he did and where he did serve right yeah and and surprised Lendl Martina Navratilova like everyone knows her like you know she she only retired from playing doubles like maybe eight or ten years ago right she was still winning slams and doubles you know in you know in recent years um and she's an interesting character because you know they 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 canceled her last year for saying something pretty not that controversial in my opinion but she kind of held tight to her uh but imagine canceling martina navratilova for not being woke enough <laughs> there you go exactly yeah Monica Sellis, of course, she was really good. And then there was that crazy thing that happened with her getting stabbed mm. in the back. Um, that was, you know, probably an event that deserves more looking at from a variety of, um, of angles. You know, maybe I could apply some of my analysis skills because I, I wasn't doing what I do now then. And so I was just like, oh, that's fucking weird, right? And of course, the person who stabbed her wanted Steffi Graf to win, right? And so... Um, Steffi Graf is interesting, you know, um, I find her weird, you know, but she definitely dominated for a short period of time in a way, you know, that was noticeable. Mary Pierce was always one of my favorite tennis players. I really liked her. Um, you know, like I don't, I think she's, she, she's an American that grew, is, is she French? Is she an American? Well, well the re- interesting thing with Mary Pierce when I was doing my research is that she seems to have now lived a life of exile or mm-hmm. seclusion, I should say, rather than exile, off the off the island of Malagascar mm-hmm. in the Indian Ocean. She um so she, she's I, just got totally gone off the radar, totally. She was at the French Open this year, I remember because they did a camera close-up of her, so she was there watching this year. Um, she was always one of my favorite players, but even she, she was like that, even as a tennis player, she'd be gone for long periods of time, come back, not play well, then suddenly win. Um, there's another tennis player um, now that I think reminds me quite a bit of Mary Pierce in terms of look and her name, uh, Victoria Azarenka, right? She really has that same style with the braid and the headband and whatnot. So sometimes when I'm looking at her, it looks like sort of the recreation of Mary Pierce. Um, but she was an interesting person, and I am really very curious about what the background of her family is, and and and, and uh, if the, maybe they're in intelligence work or something like that. Because I believe it was either I think she was an American living in France, like that grew up in France and so competed for France. Yes. She, yeah. There's and, some dual nationality thing going on with Mary Pierce, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and then obviously Andre Agassi is one of the 
most interesting and unique characters in sports and such it's amazing how different his personality was early in his career from how it it was later in the and then now but he also has that grinding style of game of like every point a lot of running around a lot of at his best right at his worst he didn't give a shit but at his best every point was also a match point he was mm-hmm. gonna the early return of serve Serena Williams and Venus Williams, obviously, like there's so much to say about that. And what I'm going to suggest about that, because you get into some stuff about the Williams at the bottom that I just don't think we have time to give justice to today. So when we do our follow up, I'm going to suggest that we do one of the section segments just on the Williams family as a whole, because there's a lot of things going on there. So I'm going to say let's table the Williams talk for today. Um, and then Pete Sampras to me was always fucking boring as shit. Like I, th- I thought he was handsome. Right. And it was like fun to watch him like serve and nobody be able to hit it back. But like, he didn't str- have that kind of unique personality that I like. I just find him to be kind of a. The, the interesting thing about Sampras is you have like Agassi doing an amazing um, advert for Nike, a promo. Right. And it's sort of, I think it's pre smells like teen spirit by Nirvana. Yeah. So that promo could have actually influenced that amazing music video. Uh-huh. And it's him playing in what looks like a rock concert mm-hmm. with the red hot chili peppers um, in, in one of the stands. But it's actually him playing a game of tennis but it changes the perception. Is it a rock concert or is it a game of tennis? Mm-hmm. So Agassi was this like rock and roller bringing new people into the game that wouldn't really see tennis as exciting. And then Pete Sampras comes, who's Mr. Robotic. Yep. And it's like, again, it's like that great rivalry between these two different personalities and styles and Pete Sampras actually was turning the British population off Wimbledon because he won it three years consecutively. And I remember speaking to people and they were like, not watching it. And I was like, why? Sampras is going to win again. It's boring. And the thing with the British public when they watch Wimbledon, they don't really care for like, like the person representing the nation. It's more about the personality. Yeah. So Goran Ivanisevic, he played Tim Henman yep. in an epic rain delayed semi-final when Ivanisevic won. Now, half of the crowd, they were supporting Ivanisevic, even though the majority of that crowd were British. Right. So it's so it's a Wimbledon's a very interesting um place for well, loyalty. Well, they like it when a Brit does well. They're not, they, they like certain personality types and they like, the, like the, the Brits always loved Andy Roddick. The Brits, lo- you know, even though he, he never actually won, he was in it to win it many times and he got a lot of support there. I mean, he was definitely a crowd favorite. They, 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 they love Nick Kyrgios, who is not respectful of, uh, in, in a lot of people's eyes, but he has huge personality and it's fun to watch. And so the, the Brits are not um, sort of obsessed with their own. Like, I think they like it when they liked it that Andy Murray was able to win. They like it whenever they have a new star that seems like they have some possibilities, but you're correct. They're, they're not partial only to their own. Um, Stefan Edberg and Yvonne Lendl, like, I don't have much memories of them other than always hearing their names because they were around during that period of time. But I did, I was quite a fan of Leighton Hewitt who only retired not too many years ago, right? And he was of course the last winner. He won in 2001, right before 9-11, just like you said. He was another guy that played every point like it was match point. He was one of the great, he was, you know, not the highest talent level but he did win two majors. He won Wimbledon and he won the US Open. Um, but this sort of warrior fighting, I'm going to, I'm going to grind you down. I'm going to exhaust the shit out of you. I'm going to play every point like it's match point and we'll see who's standing at the end. So a point about why Lendl's really important is Lendl has a reach into pop culture. Now Lendl was at the time linked with Adidas, mm-hmm. who were his, who was the suppliers of his, of his kit, so to speak. And they made a specific Lendl range Mm -hmm. that was based on Argyle sweaters 
Mm-hmm. And for some reason, it just had this pop culture narrative. I remember, yeah. And the first sneakers of 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 a of, of big range that I that I ever had as a child was at the time there was Adidas, Nike, or Puma, where a Van Lendel limited edition. Right. So um, my mother managed to get them from a place in Liverpool called Wade Smith because because she got to about. I don't know, eight, nine, and people were starting to get personalities with clothes. Mm-hmm. That, that that sort of links, that's another story that links with Liverpool if, football. Yvonne Wendell has also, he was the coach that helped Andy Murray to finally win Wimbledon that's, and yeah. that finally came through. Um, and so there's that sort of interesting connection there. Um, so with the, the story, um, my mother just presented me the shoes. I never went with her to get the shoes because all the people wearing Pumas and Adidas and Nike. And because they were a limited edition range, they had more um, juice than like everybody else because everybody else was wearing the same box standard Adidas superstars, uh-huh. which are known as Shell Toes or Cortezes, which are Nikes. And I had these unusual things, and they were like, you've got a Van Lendel limited edition. And it was just on the side. So a Van Lendel, I don't know how much say he had in the range. I don't think he would have had that much say. But Adidas used him to promote a new range of clothing that is still got street mouse. Still popular, yeah. And I, I do, I think some of the players have quite a bit of say, like, right? Like, you know, you have, you know, a couple hundred people who are in the professional tour that we see on a regular basis. Most of them have some level of clothing sponsor, right? The top, you know, the, the top players are some, you know, have bigger contracts with bigger companies and whatnot. But there's only a few players that get their own lines, right? So Nadal has his own line. Federer has his own line. Um, uh, Maria Sharapova did. Serena Williams does. There's a few others that do. Like I'm, I'm guessing Osaka has her own line at this point. Um, there's a few other people general, like, that have their own lines of things, but not, not very many. The, the others will wear similar clothes to each other. Like they're from the same line that Nike puts out for the whole year. So I think there has always been, it would be interesting to know if he, if that whole thing really started with him, right? If he was the first person to really have his own line, I'd have to go back and see if maybe Chris Everett did or Jimmy Connors did or something like that before. But yeah, that seems like the time, the period of time where that was starting to happen. And I'd say Machen, I'd say Bjorn Borg was the starter of it with, with Fila. He okay. was like the classic feeler, yeah. a sweat, sweat a jacket, a tracksuit jacket. Was it his own line, or was it he just wore their line and he had? I think to- it. I think it was their own line, but it was yeah. sort of tennis and fashion combining yeah. to then get yeah. into the pop culture. And I think McEnroe was the first tennis player to be sponsored by Nike. Right. Back in like 1982, 1983. So I want to, as we sort of wrap up this first segment, and then we're going to get into some of the more current social political machinations going on around some of the players and around what's going on at the U.S. Open right now, what's been going on in tennis all summer. But as we wrap up this first hour, I want to sort of explain, because you started your um, you started your notes to me. I thought I love I love when, when you're describing me to myself. <laughs> Emily is obsessed by the game of tennis, whilst Darren currently has a respect for the game, right? So my obsession with tennis is very different than my obsession with gymnastics, right? I was a gymnast. I have tremendous respect for how incredibly hard it is. I spent my life around that. The thing with tennis is different. Like I it gives my mind an exercise in a way that no other sport does, right? Because it's, you have the, especially now, like the game is far more athletic than it's ever been. So you have the athletic component of it, but you also have this component of it that is like chess, right? That's like Mm -hmm. chess. 
There's the component that is sort of like geometry, right? Understanding the geometry of the court and the angles, right? So, I mean, that's something that comes up in designing plays and like football and whatever as well, but you don't see it so often in an individual sport. And then you have the, these characters, these larger than life characters and the industries that come up around them. And what I have discovered, so to me, the, the sports that I'm interested in, tennis, gymnastics, and, and baseball, and baseball to a much lesser degree than tennis, but there is a lot of interesting stuff there. They're quite esoteric. And I think they're the most archetypical type of sports. And so for me, they're part of the reason I talk about tennis so much is not just that I want to make everybody listen to the shit that I'm obsessed with. Although I like that too, right? <laughs> I'd be lying if I said it otherwise. But I... Nothing has helped me more to understand the, the machinations going on in our reality than, than watching and observing tennis and, and the whole thing, not just the game on the court, but the way it's analyzed, the way it's presented to the public, the way the sponsorship works, the personality types, the whole thing. It's a tremendous exercise for my mind in every direction, and it has given me an understanding of metaphysics and geopolitics and archetypical behavior and um well so just interrupt you are correct again because one of the and i'll bring this more to the attention when we have our end of year review but the the wimbledon's men's single final this year was on a sunday a few hours later in the same city in the north of london was the euro final with england and italy now, what happened at Wimbledon is I've never been, I've had friends that have gone, maybe you've had friends that have gone, is that it is stewarded by members of the military. Mm -hmm. They look after uh, people, where's your seat? This is where this is, this is where that is. Um, there's a ring of um, anti-terrorism police walking around with assault rifles, it's very well marshaled, it's very well secured. Yet when there was the final a few hours later in the National Stadium, people just rushed it. And all there was was stewards on minimum wage mm -hmm. that was between them and entering the stadium. And some of these people even entered the VIP section. And one threatened to throw off a Formula One driver called Landau, Landau Norris off the balcony if he didn't give him his watch, which cost £40,000. So the nation was somewhat it, tennis and football that day summed up where the nation was. Well, if the rich and the powerful go to Wimbledon, they're protected by anti-terrorism police, military within the stadium, as well as highly trained, uh, well-paid members of staff. But if they go to a soccer game, it's a free-for-all. And that's all within the same city in a matter of hours. Yeah, no, that's a, you know, that's, that's an interesting observation. And the other thing I will say is part of the reason the military is involved in 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 because they always are. You always have a lot of royal mountain, the royal police and military and things like that. There, it looks much more like you know, it looks like it's from another era when you're looking at the way it's being controlled than than the way things are here. It is my my opinion, just my opinion, my belief, but I think I'm right that it's these some some sports, not all of them some sports and many aspects of the Olympics, and I was able to find the documentation on this, have always been part of the ordering of the world of warfare. And at this point in the very strange times we're living in, unconventional, asymmetric, psychotronic warfare, right? And so you have, I mean, I think there is some legitimacy to the idea that when you have these two players battling it out, center court, Wimbledon, whether it's final or semi-final or whatever, it depends on the scenarios. And it isn't, it isn't just about nationality because we know that we live in a supranational world right now. So we live in a globalist world. These, these players are representing factions and you see that in their sponsorships, 
but you also see that in their associations off the court. They are there representing factions and these factions are at war for dominance. And they have decided that this is the way they battle. It's a different, it's much more esoteric. It's got much more of a ripple that moves out into the archetypical like world and realm, the metaphysical realm than just your regular hardcore warfare as we think of it. But this is warfare among the royalty, whereas the football match is like the Antifa and the Proud Boys on the street, right? Mm. Or whatever it and is. And another example of Grand Slam tennis is there is a lot of attention played to who is in the VIP gallery, yeah. almost as if it's like a Paris fashion show, yep. who's on the runway. Yep. So it's more about who is watching the actual performance, sometimes in the performance itself. Yep. So when you watch Wimbledon, it's like, oh, here is the woman who was behind the AstraZeneca vaccine. Right. And she's sitting there and she's waving to everybody. Right. And then everybody's watching her. And then Meghan Markle made yep. the deliberate decision to watch Wimbledon with the hoi polloi on centre court and not in the royal box. Right. But then when people were suddenly surprised that sitting in a row next to them further down was Meghan Markle or, in, or behind them and they wanted to take a photo, she then got the military and the staff of the All England Club to either politely tell the people not to do that or to actually remove them from center court. Right. So she wants to be with the people, but she's not willing to act like a people. <laughs> there you go. So that's it. So so there's all so she said it was an invasion of her privacy. But ultimately, if you're that obsessed about your privacy, don't go marrying Prince Harry. Right. That, there's all sorts of interesting stuff going on there. But no, to your point, I mean, there is who is watching. There is how it's being watched. There's some, like, I was watching this one tennis match earlier this year. It wasn't a major. It was just a 500 level event in Barcelona. But when I was watching the way the court was set up, I was like, this is a really weird court, dude. This is like an altar, right? And the mm -hmm. way certain people were placed in the audience and the way the sponsorship emblems were placed around the arena and the way it sat in in sort of like with the the city's lines behind it and whatnot i'm like this is a magic ritual going on and, and i was watching you know kind of an epic engaged battle right between rafael nadal and i can't remember who it was at this point but this was a super intense match it was like more intense than some of the ones i've seen in the grand slams this year and this felt like this is where a lot of like the highbrow European high rollers come to place their bets. And I don't mean betting on the sport. I mean, their guy, versus this guy versus this guy, each one, you know, this is their guy, this is their guy. And these two are duking it out. And, you know, the sort of overall rise and fall of the factions that are based on sponsored corporate conglomerations or, or partnerships or alliances or whatever, like the dominance or the or the recession of them. Well, I always I always found Ro Roland Garros mm -hmm. to represent something basic in humanity because it's clay and it's like dirt in a way, and it's got and a lot of the big players have struggles with Roland Garros, like Pete Sampras, mm -hmm. I think never won there, but he dominated all the other Grand Slams. And mm -hmm. there's something about Roland Garros. Primal, that primal. It's primal, that's the word, it's primal. It, it, it confuses people, it, it, people can't suss it out. Everyone else can suss out the other three Grand Slams, but there is something about Roland Garros that, certain players just don't like. So one of the things that is interesting about Roland Garros is aside from Wimbledon, which is, you know, really grounded in royalty and their kinds of, you know, the lawn club, you know, sort of ethos, all of the other majors and most other tennis courts and things like that, that have, you know, masters 1000s at them or, or even 500 level events, they, um, they're named after tennis players or people who, you know, something like that, right? Uh, Roland Garros was a military, was a war hero in France, 
right? And the, what they call the red clay is the tear batu, which means the battered earth, right? So it is kind of like exactly what you said. This is closer to what the way we traditionally think of warfare would have been set up. Two gladiators battling it out in the dirt, right? Like using whatever, you know, physical assets and guile they have, but mm -hmm. you, you, it's not, it's, it, you don't get the same amount of help that you get from the other surfaces, right? When you're on grass, that is a fast moving. You can, if you have any power at all, it's gonna assist that. This is really primal. This is about, you have the power that you can generate from inside yourself or you don't. And, and that's it. And the ones who, you know, can't sort of generate that ongoing and never ending amount of energy to continue battling struggle there, right? There, it's just, it's not, it's not for the weak of heart. All right, let's do this. Let's wrap up the, uh, the first segment here. Thank you for listening to us go on and on about tennis. And now we're going to get into on the other side, the socio-political aspect of it. We're going to talk about what's going on with some of the biggest stars in the sport. Before we do though, Darren, remind people where they can find you. I am exclusively on Twitter. It's open to everyone. Very easy Twitter. Alt underscore Daz. And there I am. A-L-T underscore D-A-Z. All right. You guys can go to patreon.com forward slash off planet media or emilymoyer.locals.com for part two. We'll see you on the other side.